Good evening. This is John Milburn for Laws 12059 Conveyancing. We're into week 11 of Term 2, 2018. And next week, I'll release the take-home paper. This week, we're dealing with remedies, um, which is um, chapter number nine of your text material. And this will be the last week of substantive content. Next Wednesday, I'll be online if you wish to engage with me just for general review and general questions. So first, the take home paper. I released an information guide. I do hope that you've seen it. Um, that came through in, in a news forum material. And I'm releasing the paper on Thursday, the 4th of October at 6.30 p.m. I will release that through Moodle in the usual manner. So go to assessment number three shortly after 6.30 and hopefully you will see it there. If you have any problems, I'll remain online. So please send me an email. At, um, it's due on Friday, the 5th of October at 11.45 p.m. So you have over 24 hours to complete the task, but you certainly won't need all of that. I expect that um, you should be able to complete the task in certainly in three hours. Um, if you complete it in less time than that, so much the better, don't be concerned. There aren't any particular tricks to the take home exam. So what's in the take home exam is um, uh, essentially what we've covered during the weekly sessions. In total, there's a 2000 word limit. Do try to stick to that limit. If you really must, you can go up to 2,200. Um, once you go past 2,200 words, I'm really starting to look at it very critically to wonder why you've done that. So economy of words is something that I value and try to restrict it to 2,000. If you have to, go to 2,200. Now, each question is worth 10 marks. And given that the assessment in total is worth 50 marks, 50% um, of the overall assessment, then you'll understand that each question is worth 10 marks and there are five questions that you need to answer. You do have the obligation or the or request of you that you answer question number one. So that is, if you like, the mandatory question. It's worth 10 marks, the same as the others, but that's the one that I do request everyone answer. And then you have a choice. Questions two to six, you have a choice and you answer four of those five. So in essence, you just drop off one of those questions, some uh, question two or three or four or five or six, don't answer one of them. If you choose to answer all of them, and it it's a remarkable that almost every year somebody does, um, I'll, an I'll mark the first five as they appear on your paper, which would usually be um, uh, two, to, two to five in this scenario. Now, all six questions are problem-based, practically orientated questions. I do expect that when you provide your response, that you footnote reference your material in the usual manner. I don't require that in, a, in a, an invigilated handwritten examination, but in a take-home paper, the usual rules apply in terms of referencing your material and the layout of the material. So what I'd suggest is that before the um, paper before I release the paper, have your pro forma, your template set out ready to go so that you're not wasting time in formatting the material. Now, I don't recommend that you repeat the question. I'll know what the question is, so you can go straight into your answer. Um, the usual rules about word limits apply in that something in footnote material is not, I do not include that in the, in the word count. Some coordinators do, but I don't. And if it's a direct quote, I'll generally not record that. I won't include that either. So just be careful about that. But be, uh, don't go too far in terms of the word count. Um, in terms of the assessment criteria, I've set that out so that um, there's some idea of what I would regard as high distinction, distinction, credit, pass or fail. And um, that'll give you an idea of what I look for in marking your assessment material. So the best form of preparation is really to consider what we've discussed during the weekly sessions. Do look at the problems that are in the um, 
um, Moodle on the weekly basis, but really follow what I have been talking about in the various cases that we've discussed. Now, are there any questions about the take home examination? All good? All right. Let's move into the substantive area of remedies, which is chapter nine material. And um, the prescribed reading um, is in your text. Now I'm just looking to see whether it's in fact chapter nine or chapter eight. It is chapter nine of land contracts in Queensland, which I think is an excellent text, um, which very practically orientated and very authoritative. In the study guide, we've set out, as always, some key terms, or at least Dr. Nankaro did, and um, you'll see that there is a distinction between termination of a contract and rescission of a contract. You'll see the, the phrase ready, willing and able, which we use often. Um, perhaps another one that I would have put in there is tender. So when you um, are in a position where you believe that you're entitled to take the high ground, if I can use that term, you're ready, you're willing, you're able to, to perform settlement, use that phrase if you're putting the other side on notice um, of your intention to proceed to settlement and reserve your rights if you fail, if the other side fails to settle. The um, remedies are available to a, an affected party under the contract first up, but also consider statute, consider common law, consider equity. But always, in my view, look at the terms of the contract first. So if you're answering a question in relation to the rights of a party adversely affected by what has happened in the, um, by the other side or by the agent perhaps, then always refer to the contract first and then support it by reference to statute, common law um, and, and, uh, and equity. When we talk about the contract, whilst you can refer to others, the way in which I've um, approached the presentation or coordination of this unit is to rely in the context of house and land contract on the 14th edition. And you recall that it kicked over to the 15th in the first week or so, but I said that we'll stay with the 14th throughout. So if you're going to refer to the contract, then generally speaking, refer to the 14th edition. If you do refer to the 15th, um, or some other edition, perhaps you can signpost that as, um, as what you've done. But I, if I see a reference to the standard REIQ contract for houses and residential land, I will assume in marking it that you mean the 14th edition. You'll recall, of course, that when it comes to having some right to take action under the terms of the contract, there is a clear election that needs to be made in general terms. And that is that the party will either affirm or terminate the contract and there is an election. Now having made that election, it is binding on the client if you make it as the solicitor. Um, so ensure that you have both fully explained what we mean by an affirmation or a termination of a contract and taken clear, uh, clear instructions from a client in that regard. So even if the client is not specifically aware of what you've done as the lawyer representing them, the client will be bound. And if the client is upset, they may take recourse against you as the um, solicitor in some other jurisdiction or some other way. <clears throat> We've talked a lot at various times about specific performance and equitable remedy. It is referred to specifically in the contract and coupled with the ability to seek specific performance or uh, other actions that might be available to a party. And uh, again, look at the, um, at the standard contract in that regard. Now, when we talk about electing to terminate the contract, you'll note that we're not using the word rescission or rescind. So termination and rescission are different concepts. Essentially, we use the term rescission as a means of electing to do something as a result of something that was fundamentally important to the contract at the start, which um, has caused you to say that the contract should be void ab initio, at an end, 
um, as if it never existed. So that's what we use. Um, we use that term rescission in those circumstances. For example, if there is a misrepresentation that is uh, of such a degree that um, you would never have entered into the contract in the first instance, had you known the true position and you were not subject to the misrepresentation, then you would elect to rescind the contract. Likewise, if there was a mistake, um, a mutual mistake, for example, and uh, uh, the, the property referred to in the contract was never intended to be the property that was conveyed, then you're talking about a mistake and the appropriate request is to rescind or the, the appropriate election is to rescind. It's really a self-help type remedy. So it's um, for serious um, situations. And we have our younger student here again, struggling a bit in the background. Um, now, termination is where there's a, um, a defect in the title or a material misdescription of the land in the contract that's also available. So sometimes it may be a, a termination or it may be a rescission, but just take care and try not to use the terms interchangeably. Unfortunately, the fact is that when you read cases, the term rescission is used by courts at various times in different ways. Now I have an excellent text and I'll just um, show you this. I, I refer to it often. It's called remedies um, in Australian private law. So it's not prescribed, it's not on the reading list, but I use it often. It's from Cambridge University Press. And looking at that chapter 18, which is specifically on rescission, um, the authors talk about rescission being used by courts in different ways. And um, they make comment that rescission should be distinguished from termination for breach of contract. They're quite different. Rescission extinguishes the contract ab initio from the very beginning, uh, such that all obligations under the contract are no longer in existence. So let's keep that terminology when we're talking about rescission. Another term that's sometimes used in different ways is repudiation. And the sense that I'm going to use repudiation, which I think is the more common, the more modern sense of the word, is where one of the parties renounces their liabilities under the contract or show an intention no longer to be bound by the terms of the contract or fulfill the contract. And the reference there was Shevel against the Builders Licensing Board, 1982, 149. CLR 620. So when we talk about repudiation, we're really talking about doing something that says to the other party, I no longer intend to be bound by this contract. I no longer intend to fulfill the terms of the contract. So when I talk about repudiation, I'm talking about that type of behaviour. Are there any questions about the terminology then of affirmation, termination, rescission or repudiation? All good? All right. If you're a little confused about those terms, have a look at um, a good source of material. There's some good material in the study guides that uh, were written by Dr. Nankaro. There's also some good material in other sources, and I refer back to the Australian Legal Dictionary quite often, um, or your textbook. Yes, Rachel. Um, would it be an affirmation to lodge a caveat? Not necessarily. Um, you can lodge a caveat if you wish to preserve a position, but generally you would lodge a caveat if you ultimately intend to seek to have the contract performed. So usually if you're looking to rescind the contract, you wouldn't lodge a caveat because you're not trying to preserve the contract. But uh, it's not specifically an act of affirmation. It's a really good question though. Um, and, and I guess your question is, if you lodge a caveat, are you then precluded from seeking to terminate the contract or rescind the contract? I don't think you are. I think that um, it's, it's an opportunity to preserve the situation pending your election. So you, I think you can elect formally to terminate the contract, even though you may have lodged a caveat. But I think you'd be wise in those circumstances to withdraw the caveat. That's a really good question. 
I hope that answers it some way, Rachel. Yes, thank you. Just that it was conduct. So if you found that you were in the midst of a dispute and then you lodged a, a caveat, then, you know, it would look like you were affirming the contract. And then if you were seeking a rescission in court, that kind of would be counterproductive, wouldn't it? It may, it may yeah, you're right. It may well be an argument that's posed by the other side. I don't think it's fatal um, to, the, to the proposed cause, but that's a very good point. All right, so thank you. Now, I mentioned the contract and, of course, the right to terminate. So I take it that you all have your houses um, and land 14th edition in front of you. Um, there are some specific clauses that I want to bring to your attention and discuss in this context. Firstly, let's have a look at clauses three and four, which deal with issues that um, may lead to a right to terminate the contract. So clause three deals with finance, and you'll see there that um, there's an obligation to make application for finance, as we discussed, then to give notice, if you're the buyer, of your uh, de decision to um, terminate the contract or to approve the, uh, to say that the condition is satisfied or waived if you wish to proceed. But um, if you decide to terminate the contract, you do so by giving written notice within time. So again, we've got the, the word termination there, but you also need to consider the words satisfaction and waiver as well as termination and be clear about the understanding of those things. Any questions on clause three and what we mean by termination within that context? All good? Clause four um, deals with the issue of failure um, to obtain or give notice of building and pest inspection or reports. And um, clause 4.1 subsection 2, again, provides the obligation upon the buyer to give notice to the seller, either electing to terminate, which is subsection A, or to either indicate that the condition is satisfied or waived, which is subsection B of subsection 2 in 4.1. Again, similar requirement for the seller um, of the buyer to give notice within time, but on this occasion, the seller may terminate the contract, um, well, actually, in both finance and building and pest, the seller may terminate the contract if notice is not given by 5 p.m. on the day, and we talked about that last week. So are there any questions there on three and four? All good? Let's move to clause seven, and the subsections of clause seven that I want you to consider are firstly 7.4, which deals with seller's warranties, 7.5, that deals with survey and mistake, 7.6, that deals with requirements of authorities, and 7.7, that deals with property adversely affected. So firstly, 7.4 that deals with seller's warranties, uh, and you'll see there that there's an obligation on the seller to have complied with certain obligations. And if the seller breaches a warranty in clause 7.41 or 7.42, then 7.44 says the buyer may terminate the contract by notice to the seller. Again, you'll notice that there's no words used there. Uh, there's not the word rescission is not used. Um, it's termination. In this instance, it's a little different to clauses three and four in that there's no reference to um, the buyer being satisfied or waiving any of the terms because it's a different type of clause. 7.6 deals with the requirements of authorities. And again, any valid notice requiring work to be done must be fully complied with if it's issued before the contract date by the seller, if issued on or after the contract date by the buyer. And the buyer may terminate the notice if there are outstanding notices, but only in limited circumstances, not every notice. So in that regard, look at clause 
subsection 4, where the buyer may terminate the contract by notice in writing, but only in relation to certain transgressions or outstanding notices under the Building Act and the Sustainable Planning Act. As it was then, it's now the Planning Act 2016, which I'm sure has been updated in um, version 15 of the contract. So you'll notice that there are different remedies available to the buyer, even though we're saying that the buyer may terminate the notice. And there's different remedies to the seller for failure to the buyer to give notice within certain time, we're required to do so, particularly in relation to clauses three and four. Also look at clause 7.7 .7 that deals with the property adversely affected. And you'll see that um, uh, if the, at the date of contract, the, the use is not lawful under a town planning scheme or is affected by a proposal of competent authority on the land, those things haven't been uh, disclosed, then the buyer may terminate the contract by giving notice. And um, have a look at 7.7 .7 subsection 2, because that's got some teeth. And it says that if no notice is given under clause 7.7 .7, subsection 1, the buyer is treated as having accepted the property subject to all of those matters referred to in the clause. So there is that deeming provision, uh, which we don't see in the finance clause, for example. Other than that, refer to clause nine, which provides for termination or affirmation generally, either for the seller or the buyer. Now, if the buyer or seller um, fail to comply with an essential term or make a fundamental breach of an intermediate term, the seller or the buyer, as the case may be, may affirm or terminate the contract. Again, we don't see the word rescission there. And if the seller affirms the contract, then may sue the buyer for damages, specific performance, or both. If the buyer affirms, may sell the, uh, sue the seller for damages, specific performance, or damages and specific performance. Now, as we've mentioned earlier in the course, don't be, don't be fooled by the fact that um, because the buyer, sorry, the seller may sue for specific performance, that a court is likely to grant that. It's still a discretionary order and the court is not bound by the terms of the contract and um, it does not have to order specific performance if our damages is an adequate remedy. It's a little different for the buyer, given that if the buyer is seeking specific performance, it does so in relation to a unique parcel of land. And that's the difference between the buyer and seller. Um, look also at clause 9.4 and 9.5 that gives the seller and the buyer respectively rights in relation to an election to terminate the contract. So clause nine provides for the termination or the affirmation of the contract. That is for the failure to comply with an essential term or fundamental breach of an intermediate term is intermediate term defined? Is essential term defined? Any thoughts? Let's talk about intermediate term. Is that defined? Nothing on the chat facility? No, says Bronwyn, you're right. Yep, it's not defined. So you won't find a definition for intermediate term. Um, but what about essential terms? Is that defined? Yes, right, Bronwyn's quick on the buzzer tonight. Thank you. And um, you'll see that in the definitions clause 1.1, where essential term includes a number of things in the case of a breach by the buyer or the seller respectively. And for the buyer, um, those clause 2.2 relates to the payment of the deposit. The deposit has to be paid on time as an essential term. Failed to pay the deposit on time allows the seller to hold the buyer in breach of an essential term. 2.51 deals with payment of the balance purchase price. So that's an essential term imposed on the buyer. 
5.1 relates to the time and date for settlement. Now that's common to both parties. So both parties have the equal obligation to attend and effect a settlement um, at the time and date for settlement, subject only to the fact that um, time, as far as the hour is concerned, does not relate to that provision. Clause 5. Point, sorry, 6.1, which is the last of the ones referred to for the buyer, relates to time is of the essence. Um, and in fact, that's for both, both buyer and seller. 5.3, subsection 1A to D, relates to the obligation to provide the instrument of title, unstamped transfer documents, release of encumbrance, and if requested two days before settlement keys, they're the obligations imposed on the seller. Then subsections E, 2 and 3 relate to atonement notices and transfer bonds. So that's an essential requirement, essential term. And there is um, reference in 5.1F for a compliance exemption certificate for pools, uh, the pool if Q2 is in the reference schedule. And 5.5, relates to the obligation on a seller to provide vacant possession, except for tenancies as noticed, noted. So if a seller of property, which is subject to a lease, or um, sorry, which is tenanted, um, is unable to remove the tenant at settlement, if vacant possession is required under the contract, then that's a breach of an essential term as far as the um, seller's obligations are concerned. Now, am I moving too quickly or all good? Maybe I'm moving too slowly. Any questions about that? Okay, so we know what we understand what's meant by this indication of termination, and we now know what we mean generally um, about the ability to terminate in certain circumstances. Now, I mentioned the term ready, willing, and able. So it's important that if you're going to pursue the other side, for a breach that you are able to demonstrate to the satisfaction of a court that you were in fact not in breach yourself and that you were ready and willing and able to perform the settlement. So use that term if you're putting the other side on notice as I mentioned earlier. And tender. Tender means go through the procedure of showing to the world as it were that you were ready to, uh, to perform the settlement at the time and place nominated. You'd only, you'd only choose not to tender in circumstances where the other side make it very clear that they, are, they do not intend to attend the settlement. So only in those circumstances can you say, we're ready, willing and able, but it's probably a good idea to establish some proof of that, showing a copy of the title or something, whatever it is that you need to, to, to provide. So you can be excused from tendering, but only if the party for the other side makes it clear that they're not going to perform the obligation or that performance of, of going through the process of tender is useless or futile. Um, and that's very clear. So if you're an aggrieved party, you still need to establish that you're ready, willing and able to settle. Now we mentioned that there's some um, relief in equity um, and there may be some things that restrict a party's ability to terminate the contract. It, that is if the other side is able to say that um, there's been an instance of equitable estoppel or there's the principle of relief against forfeiture. And you would have seen that in land law in the context of leases, section 128 and uh, relief against forfeiture. So they're equitable remedies which can be relied upon to essentially stop a party from, or restricting a party, the other side from terminating the contract. The measure of damages is referred to in the material as well. And the innocent party will usually be compensated for the loss. Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, for the loss um, of damages sustained as a result of breach of the other side. That would normally be the deficiency upon resale. And the general rule with damages is to return the party, the injured party, to where they would have been, but for the breach. So there's the issues of causation, remoteness, mitigation. 
and the principle of remoteness was considered in Hadley and Baxendale. And there are two limbs to that. That is the, um, that which would have fairly and reasonably considered have arisen naturally or that such things reasonably supposed to have happened in the contemplation of the parties uh, when the, the contract was made. So you don't need to delve into that too much, but just be aware of that principle, contractual principle that applies in conveyancing matters. Other heads of consequential loss might be cost of repossession, rates, interest, aborted attempts at resale or the actual resale deficiency. Again, they're referred to in the contract, generally speaking, and for repossession, there's some other expenses as well. Um, damages are applicable, specific performance. We've talked about non-refundable deposits can be uh, considered in a contract. And you'll see that sometimes in a contract, it will provide for a deposit and state that it's non-refundable. Equity will still allow the return of a non-refundable deposit in some circumstances. For example, um, if the buyer can establish that the seller was acting unconscionably. There's the general rule of penalties, anything more than 10% is generally regarded as a penalty. And of course, that's a relevant figure in the context of instalment contracts as well. Um, just a couple of other brief things before we wrap up. So it's an early session tonight. Always consider the Australian consumer law. It does apply in conveyancing matters. And in particular, section 18, that deals with misrepresentation or misleading conduct. So you may wish to argue that in addition to other arguments that are based on the contract or under um, common law or statute. Always um, think about, uh, and you may also consider section 237 of the Australian Consumer Law, where a court may order rescission of land contract for misleading conduct. So you'll see there that we've got the word rescission in the context of misleading conduct, which is like misrepresentation. So section 237 of the Australian Consumer Law, the ACL relates to this concept of rescission as opposed to termination. Now, if you have any issues um, that need a quick resolution of a court, you can apply in a summary way to the court, to the Supreme Court or the District Court for a determination of a question arising out of or connected with the contract, not as to the validity or existence of the contract, but something that arises as a result of the contract. Um, and the court may, in a summary way, on the application to it, make an order that it believes is just and can make orders in relation to the consequences of the parties. So it's a quick way to resolve issues. Now, a good example of this, and it's section 70 of the Property Law Act, but you will, I'm sure you all knew that before I even said section 70, is have a look at Re McDonald. It's 1989 to QDR29. Here are the facts. The buyers entered into a contract for the purchase of real estate, paid a deposit. Later, but before completion, the buyers purported to rescind the contract and claimed return of the deposit. Um, and again, we've used the word rescind there. Possibly we mean terminate, but sometimes you'll see the courts use these interchangeably. Justice Dowsett said that the jurisdiction under section 70 does not depend upon there being no disputed question of fact, even though it's dealt with on an application, which is affidavits, and in a summary way, it means summary, but not without, a, you know, um, summary means without a trial. So it is possible to have a dispute of facts and still apply for section 70 relief for a determination by the court in a summary way. And in that case, um, His Honour said that um, the intention of the section, so again, we're looking at statutory interpretation here, was to provide a summary method for determination of existing rights and obligations between the parties. 
um, if both parties had abandoned the contract, then in, in his honour's view, it would be inappropriate to proceed by way of section 70 application. Um, I'm going to mention another two cases on section 70. The second um, is re Mujaj's M-U-J-A-J, Mujaj, 1992, sorry, 1998 to QDR-152. So a dispute arose between parties and it was to do with whether a party had complied with a condition of the contract. Now, the applicants did not tender the full balance price of $144,000. What they did was they tendered the balance after paying into court $44,000. So they didn't tender the full amount, they paid some of it into court. And then there was a dispute as to whether they had properly completed their contractual obligation um, to carry out work in relation to the matter. And the court said that the purchaser's obligation to tender on settlement was not satisfied by paying some of that money into court and taking out a section 70. What they said is that um, the buyer must, if the question of compensation has not been determined before settlement, tender the full amount at settlement, reserve their rights to issue proceedings, and then claim under section 70. So that's the appropriate way to go. Really, you should lodge the application before you even settle. Sparks and Sparks is the final case, 1999, QSC 24. Mr. and Mrs. Sparks, the buyers, sought declarations and compensation. They brought a summons under Section 70 of the Act. And the lawyer for the sellers objected to the use of that form of relief saying that the contract was still on foot uh, because, because neither party said the contract was on foot. And um, there was reference to what Just, Justice Dowson said in Ree MacDonald. The court said the proper forum for the dispute, given the amount, was in the magistrate's court. Um, but in the end, they decided to hear the matter because it was there and they had time. But they did say it's not really the place to bring it. So generally speaking, if one party at least is of the view that the contract is on foot and you really want a decision by a court in a quick manner to resolve an issue that might be about an easement or some other thing that um, is a contract condition, then Section 70 is the appropriate application to make. So have a look at the Property Law Act. I'm sure you've all had an opportunity to look at it many times. But um, have a look at Schedule 6. The definition of court means a court having jurisdiction out of the part. Um, but generally, it's the Supreme Court, but it can be the District Court. And um, then have a look at Section 329 of the Act. And it says the Supreme Court and the District Court have jurisdiction under Division 5 to make or revoke a declaration. And the Supreme Court... Um, the District Court or the Magistrates Court otherwise have jurisdiction to hear matters um, depending on the jurisdictional amounts. All right, so I hope that wasn't too quick at the end, but that brings us to the end of the substantive contact con uh, sorry, content for this unit. Next week, we're dealing with review issues, and I do hope that you have an opportunity to um, start to prepare for your take-home examination have a uh, look at problem type questions that we've discussed during this unit um, because the questions that you'll need to answer in the examination are all problem based. Okay, are there any questions before we wrap up? All good? All right. And um, I'll yes, just yes Bronwyn? Not really a question. Um, just we had a, a client called the other day who had a um, contract go through a couple of months ago before I'd started at this job. And um, they had an um, issue with the next door neighbours have a, a fire somewhere with the body corporate. 
and they have a dispute that's been going on for two years with the neighbour. It wasn't yet at QCAT stage, so all the searches that were done didn't show any dispute and it wasn't told to the agent. Not this agent, the seller had got a new agent, a previous agent knew and said that they would need to disclose it. They didn't disclose um, that there was an issue with the fence and there was like this $4,000 each party needed to pay um, to fix the fence. Apparently the dispute was going on for about two years. So our poor client had no idea, no one had disclosed it um, and the contract settled a few months before and now they've been hit with this bill. <laughs> um, so our solicitors just you know, giving them some advice at the moment. But uh, it's just, you know, some people are just plain dishonest. And what sort of, you know, we're suggesting they're going to QCAT, um, you know, to to take that up against the seller. But um, some people are just plain dishonest. And um, Sarah says, sounds unconscionable. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that's certainly. So was it a body corporate situation or was it a no, fence? The client bought a house and yep. the fence next door is oh, okay. a body corporate. Mm -hmm. But apparently the, um, the, the dispute has been ongoing with the previous seller for two years. They yep. engaged one agent who told them when they found out that they would have to disclose it. Mm -hmm. So they got rid of that agent and just got a new one and didn't tell them about it. Right, okay. Sold it to our client. Nothing came up in the QCAP, you know, trees mm. and fences. Okay. And it's just, you know, you so, just feel so sorry for these people. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and I guess it's um, I guess it's a matter of firstly of looking at the terms of the contract, rather yeah. than the starting point. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not sure I could make any comment beyond that. No, but we that's were, a tough one. It's, a, it's yeah, just some interesting actual cases that, that mm. happen. <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. All right, thank you, Bronwyn. All right, any other questions, comments? All good? All right, thank you all for sorry, joining. Sorry. sorry. Yes, Sarah? Um, with regards to the exam, you said before we're going to be just dealing with the 14th edition. I just want to print out contracts ready to go so I can flick through them. Should I just rely upon just the residential for, or should I just print out all the contracts? No. I think, um, provided? yeah, I think um, have the residential and that will probably resolve everything. To be honest, I can't recall if I made reference to other, probably the contract for commercial land and buildings and maybe the contract for residential lots in a community title scheme. Okay. The, it's a little bit of printing, but that should be enough. Um, but ha you'll have the others on your computer or you'll mm -hmm. have access to them. And so I just like paper. <laughs> right, okay. No, that's fine. Yeah. I do too. Yeah, I have a combination of the two. All right. Any other questions? All good? All right. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. I will be live next week, but with no extra new material. So we've covered the unit content now. All the best and enjoy your preparation for your final exam. Bye then.